I wanted to talk today about Jesus Christ and salvation of all men. Um, salvation has become a very misunderstood subject over the centuries. Um, in effect, we've we've come to the point where we are now saying that Christ's sacrifice is not sufficient to cover the transgressions of Adam. Um, his obedience is not sufficient to atone for the disobedience of Adam, and his blood is not powerful enough to cover the sin of Adam. Um, in effect, we're saying that God, who covered Adam and Eve with lambskins in the Garden of Eden, is not going to cover the human race that was yet in Adam's loins at that time. This uh, evil doctrine of divine, eternal, ceaseless retribution and endless torment upon the souls of sinful men uh, has led to a church without love or a church system, a religious system without love condemning the sins of the sinner and winking at the sins of the those who name the name of Christ instead of realizing that this judgment that we talk about so much begins at the house of God um, and that the fires of hell are really the refining fires of God's judgment that he will bring to bear first of all upon his own house before then judging the rest of the world through the saints. The scriptures say, do you not know that you will judge the world and even angels? Well, what does this judging of the world mean? Um, are we just going to be standing there by this literal great white throne uh, telling people guilty or not guilty as they pass by, shoving them off into uh, hellfire or giving them a harp and a um, halo to take up to heaven to sit on a cloud. Part of the problem with um, these misconceptions is so much of them seem to come from either taking the parables of Christ too literally or taking the literal statements of Paul and the others as symbolic. So case in point is that Paul never mentions hell in the entire New Testament. This was the man who said that um, he was faithful to proclaim all of the word of God. And yet he never mentioned this uh, this hellfire. Um, whereas the only people that did mention the Gehenna hell, the Greek word Gehenna, were Jesus himself in a few places. And in James who was writing to Israel. Well, this hellfire, <clears throat> this Gehenna, is really the Valley of Hinnom that was uh, located outside of Jerusalem. And um, this was where all the refuse of the city was taken to be burned. And it was a place of impurity and a place of refinement because uh, the impurities were being purged. Um, and the Valley of Hinnom all goes back to, you know, the, the, the kingdom of Israel. And it was a, um, a place of sacrificing to a pagan god, Molech. Um, so it was a defiled place, and it wasn't until King Josiah that these, uh, the, this pagan shrine and uh, an altar uh, were toppled and destroyed. So it was kind of a byword in Israel, um, and uh, Christ was speaking this as a parable of, of, of the fire of judgment, which is a refining fire that refines the impurities from man. And he was primarily speaking it to those who claim to be servants of, of God and um, warning them whereas Paul never mentions this he does talk about judgment obviously but he never mentions this supposed cosmic place of punishment called hell or Gehenna um, and so we take the statements of Christ literally where he's saying talking about you know the fire of Gehenna but in Paul will make a plain statement like <laughs> You know, God, who is the savior of all men, especially believers, or as in Adam, all die. So in Christ, all will be made alive or um, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the father. Um, or, you know, Corinthians 15, which 
you know, um, he talks about the, the plan of God for the ages that culminates in God being all in all. Well, all of these things are literal statements. You know, he's, he's talking in a very literal sense. But, but these have been twisted around to somehow be metaphors. Uh, you know, it doesn't really mean, you know, God is the saviour of all men. It means he's potentially the saviour of all men, but literally only the saviour of believers. And that's not what it means. It's a, it's a literal statement. He's not willing that any should be lost, but all should come to repentance. Um, Christ gave himself as a sacrifice for all to be testified in due time. Um, there's so many literal statements showing that Christ died once for all. Um, and it says that if, if he died for all, therefore all died. So everybody died with him on the cross. Um, and this will be realized more and more as we go through this plan of the ages. But over the centuries, it, things have become reversed. You know, we take the parables as a literal, which is very shaky ground. And then we take the literal statements as parabolic or metaphorical. And this has made an upside down faith where God just can't, you know, he loves you and he's willing to sacrifice his son for you. But if you expire, if your fleshly heart stops beating, um, he has no choice but um, to throw you into this cesspool of death and, and, and rebellion and everlasting teeth gnashing, um, which makes no sense at all it's a lousy plan for starters but secondly the scriptures say the last enemy to be destroyed is death well if the last enemy to be destroyed is death to be to be carnally minded is death um and for the last enemy to be destroyed is death means there'll be no more death at some point and there'll be no more enmity well if you're casting you know, untold millions and billions into the flames of this supposed Dante's Inferno, guess what? Death still exists in staggering proportions and enmity still exists in staggering proportions. So um, on every side, this, these, this argument of an eternal ceaseless hell falls flat on its face. Um, but it's been ingrained by something very powerful, a very, very powerful force called tradition. Um, and tradition can sometimes be used interchangeably with brainwashing because if something is done long enough and loud enough and among enough people, then it must be true. Um, and yet, it doesn't matter what scriptures say about Elijah, you know, complaining to God about being the only one left and God saying, I've, you know, reserved myself 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee to Baal, showing that there was a remnant even at that time. It's always a remnant, but no. Instead of seeing the testimony of the scriptures that it's always the remnant, we believe that, oh, the majority must be right. You know, um, the majority, because we've always believed this, therefore it's true. Well, a lot of people have always believed a lot of things that are not true. Um, but this has undermined the testimony of Christ in the church. This has undermined the reality of his love. This has undermined our conformity to his image because how are we like him if we see if we can't love the world as he loves the world if we don't see that he died for the world because he loves and will love and will always love the world if we don't see this how can we behave the same way if we don't see this how can we love as he loves be conformed to his image be perfect even as our heavenly father is perfect who is kind to the just and the unjust um, we've lost so much because of this lie that's been swallowed and regurgitated and used to brainwash the masses over the, over the centuries. And this has been a great falling away from the truth. This, the, you know, the scriptures are clear that he who loves knows God because God is love. And this is not a saccharine, sugary love. It's a vigorous love that involves discipline and refinement and chastisement and scourging. He, he scourges every son he receives. He chastises those who he loves. This is not a this is not a kind old granddad who does nothing but give sweet sweeties to his little grandchildren. This is a father who is interested in um, our growth and our maturity and our being conformed to the image of his beloved son. But we've lost all of this uh, this sense of purpose because it's all become about salvation now. You know, all we want to do is be born. You know, if we can just be born, if we can be born again, that's all that matters. Can you imagine if in this world someone said, I just want to be born as a baby into this world and then it's all good? It would be ludicrous for someone to say that. That 
you know, they're in the womb and the height of their ambition is simply to be born. You know, our desire should be to mature and to be uh, conformed to the image of Jesus Christ.